So welcome to our ARM AI virtual tech talk series. Uh, my name's Tobias. I'm one of the uh, AI ecosystem team here. Uh, I'm based in Cambridge myself uh, at ARM. I'm really excited to present the latest in our bi-weekly series uh, of AI virtual tech talks. They're designed to bring together experts from ARM uh, and speakers from a whole host of our partner companies uh, in the partner program that we run for artificial intelligence. Uh, each session we run is going to have, be hosted by a different person and will include a different speaker. And they're going to discuss the latest trends, whether it's AI development of deployment of AI, optimization, best practices and, and new technologies. Um, so before we get cracking, just to let you know, we've got a couple more uh, tech talks before we close out the year uh, that are coming up. We've got obviously our one today. Uh, on November 17th, we're really excited to be hosting uh, a suite of companies talking about the smart city, uh, which is going to prove to be hopefully something really interesting. Uh, and we're really excited to be hosting them. Uh, and we've also got a December talk from Slamcore, uh, and they're going to be hosting and talking about uh, spatial AI in embedded devices and actually show, showing off a, a robot, robot demo. So we're really excited for that as well. I'm going to paste a link into the, uh, to the chat uh, now. If you want to sign up to the next Arm Virtual uh, Tech Talk, please do so. You can follow the link in the description below. So we're really, really excited, as I said, uh, to host Deep Light today. Uh, just to let you know before we get cracking, at the end of this talk, uh, you'll be asked about that short survey. We'd love to get your feedback on how it went uh, and thoughts you can make for any improvements you can think of. Uh, and as a little reward for doing so, we're going to enter those who uh, do finish the uh, complete the survey into a random draw. And they're going to be able to be you know, the chance of winning two Arduino Nano 33 BLE development boards. So I'll remind you of that at the end. But just to remind you uh, at the beginning of the talk as well. Uh, that we will be running that draw as well. So as I said, today we're really excited to be joined by one of our amazing AI ecosystem partners, DeepLight. Uh, they're going to give you a fascinating insight into how to make deep neural networks faster and more energy efficient when running on particularly low power hardware. Uh, and at the end of this talk, there'll be an opportunity for an open mic Q&A session. Uh, as well as you to answer, uh, put questions in the Q&A uh, in the Zoom box. Please make sure if you've got the Zoom client that you're uh, using that, you can enter your questions in the Q&A box there and we'll be happy to answer them. So uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce, uh, let Davis and Charles from Deep Light introduce themselves. Super excited to have you both today. The floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tobias. So as, as you mentioned, uh, my name is Davis and also joined by Charles from DeepLight today. We're very, very excited to talk about why small is big, why we want to make neural nets faster, uh, more energy efficient for low power hardware. We're also super excited for everyone's questions and the open mic session at the end of our, our slides. So quick introduction. I'll go first. So myself, my name is Davis. I lead our product development here at DeepLight, also joined by Charles. Yeah, hi everyone, pleasure to, to virtually meet you. Um, so I'm Charles Marsh, uh, I'm Chief Commercial Officer at Deep Light. I'm based out of our headquarters here in uh, Montreal, Canada. Exactly, awesome, awesome. Yeah, so we're, we are joining you guys from a very snowy uh, Montreal today. Uh, I appreciate everyone taking the time. I know our friends south of the border have a very big day today. So we'll keep it fun, we'll keep it uh, informative and look forward to, to yeah, the, you know, everyone's questions. So to kick things off, you know, very quickly, uh, as twice mentioned, we're part of the ARM AI ecosystem. Uh, I think it's it's an absolutely fantastic program for, for startups, software, hardware, anyone alike. So we really recommend if you're serious about AI and you're doing things with, with ARM hardware, and let's face it, who isn't, uh, let's certainly, uh, we certainly recommend you to, to join the, the program. So for today's contents, uh, we're going to talk about three main three main parts. Uh, the first part is really tiny ML. Maybe some of you are familiar with that term. Um, it's certainly becoming more and more prevalent nowadays. Basically, tiny ML, of course, small. So the idea is that there's a lot of opportunity when we make neural networks, especially the deeper, more, more sophisticated convolution and other types of neural networks uh, applicable for these kinds of devices. So that's a super exciting topic for sure. The second topic we're going to talk about are the emergence of domain-specific architectures, hardware architectures, especially in the low power side, that are becoming really well-equipped to do our deep neural network inferencing and allow us to solve some previously very difficult use cases. So a lot of excitement there, we'll, we'll talk about in more detail. And then the last part about software stacks. So all about the ease of use, all about how do we make the infrastructure more mature so that we can keep taking our, 
our awesome applications or awesome use cases and make them applicable for the edge. So Charles is gonna go deep on, on that section there. And then as Tobias mentioned, we'll have an open mic Q&A after our quick uh, presentation here. So let's begin. As you mentioned, uh, you know, really, I think the first section here, all about sensor data, all about how we can analyze the sensor data with compact AI models. I think we're at an exciting point where good is good enough and we can have accurate enough predictions, or acceptable enough predictions with compact algorithms on battery powered devices using sensor data. And the convergence of these three things in the milliwatt, even microwatt power sphere has been just exploding in terms of things like wake words, anomaly detection, a huge amount of things we can do nowadays by making these algorithms smaller. And at the same time, you have these optimized hardware architectures that are allowing you to take a neural net, you might have trained for something in the cloud, and now adapt it and port it to this really efficient, really cool um, new processor type, or even existing processor types that are now just in the huge, huge volume and allowing us to start doing uh, cool things on the edge. And then lastly, as we mentioned, the easy to use AI software. Really, it's about lowering the friction to adoption. If, if you ask the question, you know, why aren't more of these intelligent applications deployed? Well, the bottom line is that it's still pretty difficult for a lot of these applications to be, to be done. So I think we really want to talk about how we can make this possible. And as you mentioned, you know, as, as we keep going here, as we go through the slides, you know, please, any clarifications, questions, throw them in the chat and any other things in the QA, Q&A uh, tab, we can also bring those up in real time as we go here. So why TinyML? I think it's, it's something that a lot of people have become more familiar with, but just to set the scene, you know, there are billions and billions and billions of devices out there. It's a big number of, of these small, small little things. And so over the last, you know, 20, 25 years, over hundred billion of these types of devices have been shipped. And in the neck, in a span of only three years, that number was surpassed. And what this means is right now, all around you, you have all of these tiny battery powered things that can do relatively interesting and, and useful applications for us. I think a really commonplace one now is like wake words. So the ability to analyze audio in real time, 10 years ago was not something a lot of people were doing. Now it's, it's absolutely everywhere. You can, almost can't go into a room without some device uh, ready to listen to your, your voice. So this is really important from a systems and architecture perspective. How this has become possible is really interesting. And then what does that mean for setting the scene going forward? How can we leverage the same paradigm to really unlock all the value by bringing AI to these devices. But as you can suspect, these tiny devices have very strict memory, very strict speed and cost and resource constraints. And so a lot of the community nowadays in academia and also industry is contributing you know, left and right different approaches to, to actually make this possible. And we're gonna go into a handful of these approaches and show some trade-offs on a specific use case on how we can actually whittle down a, a visual detection model to fit into something like a microcontroller. So that, that's pretty cool. Maybe we're going to talk about that in just a second. But in general, this is the trend we're facing. We just have a massive number of these small things around us that we can put AI in for inference computation. And I think this is, this is a good way to kind of get a pulse check on, on what's happening nowadays. As I said a couple of times, you know, a lot of milliwatt, microwatt devices doing computer vision on a battery powered device or doing you know, voice translation uh, in, in real time. So we have these data types, we have vision, we have voice, we have vibration, uh, different sensor modalities. We have a lot of off the shelf algorithms, these, these mobile nets and squeeze nets and things that have become applicable in the community, but adapting them to your use case is still something that's non-trivial in a lot of cases. So I think one of the big questions is how do we take these devices, how do we take these algorithms and, com and compartmentalize them into an actual solution that can do something useful for us. And so in this slide, you see a, a kind of snippet of some well-known use cases now of course, wake words, super prevalent, uh, can be done in you know, a couple hundred kilobytes of, of, of model, model memory. And, and it's, it's really useful. And I think that this has been a really good way that small, you know, tiny ML applications has revolutionized how we interact with our devices, what our devices can do for us. So translate that, that wake words, audio wake words from the audio domain to the visual domain. And we have a new use case called visual wake words. And basically what this means is in this example, uh, you know, person, not person, basically, is there a person in the picture, is there not? But you can apply this general concept to literally any kind of binary classification. So maybe it's, you know, dog or no dog, maybe it's intruder or no intruder. So these kinds of general binary classifications are really good for tiny devices because the output labels are small. You only really need to predict maybe a handful of small things to wake up a larger processor to do more complicated analysis for you. So instead of having to run these always on very expensive, you know, cloud connected applications, 
what TinyML, what small neural networks can do for us is actually offload a lot of that computation to the very edge of the network and make it very efficient. That's really cool. And on the third, uh, third example here, really you know, a high level idea about anomaly detection. I think that there's a lot of cases where we actually don't need to send a huge amount of information back to the cloud. And if we can classify these anomalies or at least detect these anomalies with relatively little uh, effort or little computation, this is super exciting for things like manufacturing, uh, inspection, uh, even, even some more consumer device applications as well. And if you're curious, uh, one of the hubs for this kind of stuff is TinyML and TinyML Perf. Uh, really great communities and MLPerf has been really cool in terms of standardizing uh, some of the work going on here. And again, you know, all about the low power uh, devices as well, of course, that's a big thing there. And as we mentioned, you know, an example of how this actually works. So at DeepLay, we took a use case, which is the visual wake words. And we took a model, mobile net v1 uh, alpha of 0 0.25. So it's already a really small model. And we asked ourselves the question, well, what kind of trade-offs can we make using our optimization purely from software to realize you know, what would be the different thresholds you want for a given device. And what you can see here is the dialing up and dialing down of accuracy with also size and then throughput or latency as another trade-off. What you can see here from this curve pretty clearly is from some initial seed model or some initial baseline model, what optimization does for you is it allows you to make these different trade-offs and essentially Pareto curve around what you need out of your application. So starting from some baseline like 85% accurate, 1.1 megabytes, but you can actually live with 80% accurate, but what you really need is 130 kilobytes or maybe less than 256 in this example. So what we're doing here is basically throttling different dimensions of the model to enable it to meet the different trade-offs a user would want. And we use what's called design space exploration to do this. This has been a really cool paradigm, I think, for the tiny ML and even any kind of efficiency trade-off where you have trade-offs you need to make, but doing them in an automated way is, is not, so, not so easy. And so we certainly want to visualize, you know, how is this possible? And we can get into some of the nuances of the actual mechanisms we're taking here, like uh, tensor decomposition or quantization, as we've mentioned here. These are some of the knobs you have when you want to uh, actually make this possible. So kind of in summary, you know, TinyML, really exciting stuff. Making neural networks small has been really impactful to do more on microcontrollers and, and embedded devices. And yeah, uh, please, any questions, any clarifications, just throw them in the chat and we'll address them uh, in real time here as we go through the material. So with all these small algorithms and all these small use cases, I think the natural question is, well, where do we run them? And that kind of leads us to, you know, what's happening right now in the hardware space about domain specific architectures, particularly on the low power side, a lot, a lot of innovation coming from how do we make more compact and, and more efficient uh, devices. And this is really brought on by, I think David Patterson put it really well uh, in that, you know, we have to do a few tasks, but extremely well. And that's the name of the game, especially in this tiny ML space about specializing your algorithms, optimizing your algorithms. You can't optimize to do everything great. You can optimize to do a few things great. And that's, that's really what we're, we're seeing happen here. And I think the icing on the cake is that while we're having this, you know, as the economist put it, uh, you know, hyenas versus cheetahs. So hyenas being multi-purpose, cheetahs being single purpose. We actually can see a, a co-design emerging from the optimization software with the hardware side, the hardware optimization. And the two are really, really beneficial to each other. We see this explosion around new options and new ways to do your inferencing and doing your, your deployment on especially the edge and IoT devices. This is a great summary from, from James Wang about a year ago. And I, I used a year ago slide to show how already out of date this is. There's already so many new chips, so many new players that you, know, you, just, you just can't keep track of it all. But the cool thing I think is that you have different candidates for different workloads and you have different complementary technologies to make different products. I think a really cool example of this is something from Max Integrated, where you have a CNN accelerator, an ARM Cortex M4, and then a RISC-V CPU. And I think this is a good template for what we're trying to make happen here. We have different compatible technologies to handle different types of the given workload, ultimately with the goal of making it as efficient and fast as possible. And what this is going to lead to, right now about 1% of these time mode devices are doing some kind of AI or shipping with some AI. In five years, 50% of these devices will be doing some type of machine learning AI. So that explosion and proliferation and adoption is going to create a lot of new use cases. And one of the things I forgot to mention the tiny ML side is that I think we're just scratching the surface. I think that we're really just starting to scratch the surface of, of what we can actually do with these types of devices as we keep exploring the design space. And that's why this co-design and design space exploration is so important so that we can keep exploring uh, what's, what's even possible.
just take a quick pause here. Uh, you know, Charles Tobias, any, any questions, anything to add uh, at this point? No, I think all, all good. That we're waiting for those questions to come in. But uh... cool, no problem. Yeah, don't don't be shy. We're more than happy to work this in, and then there will be a chance uh, open mic at the end. But kind of moving along here. So again, along this domain specific uh, topic, you can see this portfolio. I think a really interesting hardware from ARM, for example, and this really visualizes the idea here that you have different breeds of processors for different types of workloads you want to run, and these different Workloads have different requirements, such as the throughput or the amount of data required. And I think one of the things from the modeling community and the software community is, okay, how do we take advantage of this? How do we, how do we co-design and, and build our workloads to actually get them running in the most efficient, most competitive way uh, across the board? So right now, a lot of this is manual. A lot of this is you know, taking some heuristics, taking some observations and applying them in a DevOps environment to retrain, maybe do some continuous learning if you're doing any continuous learning and then roll out your model from one stack to another. And this is a big limiting factor, I think, in, in getting stuff onto the devices. This manual trial and error is really a bottleneck for, for getting machine learning out into the wild. At the same time, there are some optimizations that are becoming very standard and commonplace, uh, you know, using lower precision like int8, for example, for inference, it's I think very standard nowadays, very well known, very well accepted. And you see a lot of that being baked into silicon now which will of course lead to efficiency gains over, over the coming, coming product cycles. But there's a lot more we can do than just quantizing the end date, for example. I think one of, the, one of the underrated aspects is of course, how much you can adapt your model once you have your data, once you have your use case, how much you can adapt from some off-the-shelf algorithm to really make the most of your use cases. This is of course considering things like what's your acceptable accuracy, what's your desired throughput, but actually baking these KPIs into your model are not, not clear. And so I think the more work we do around standardizing these optimizations, making them more well-known and more uh, implementable or acceptable will be really cool. And this includes things like beyond into, you know, mixed precision. So allocating a different bit precision to each layer in your network, fusing layers where, where possible, where it's useful for the memory on your chip, uh, inducing sparsity. So sparsity has been around for a while, but taking advantage of it is still something that I think we're on the cusp of in, in some scenarios. Distillation, so it is that training large and then displaying that information to smaller models. And then new operations and new layer types. So as it's well known, you know, even confidence themselves are changing all the time. You have transformer networks coming out and they're becoming more common now. I think being super conscious of this and finding ways to use them intelligently in our design space, in our product designs, will really yield to big, big performance gains. This goes in hand in hand with, you know, of course, the new IPs we're talking about. Uh, for different use case complexity. So baking in that hardware complexity with also your modeling complexity to really make the most of those. And last one from me before I hand off to Charles to go deeper into some of the software stack of things is a quick snippet of results. So what we, what we mean by these optimizations and, and what it can really do for you. So we've highlighted a couple of columns, uh, the of course compression side and then the accuracy drop side. So you can imagine these are two functional controls you have over, over, over your application and optimization space. One of the really exciting things is that when you can compress a model to meet on-chip memory, or you can make it even less than on-chip memory, we see this explosion of ability to actually get more models into production. So this is really cool because if you can actually get multiple use cases within a certain memory threshold, for example, well, you've significantly limited the amount of off-chip memory access, power access, latency access, it really slows down a lot of use cases. So, Kind of naive example, just model size, model accuracy. But the more we take advantage of things like this, will certainly yield to, as you see in the video on the right, in some cases, 10x or even more, or around that magnitude speed up and the improvement. Again, not by changing anything from the hardware side, but purely optimizing your, 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 your models. And so when we mean tiny, we mean you know, less than a megabyte, even in some cases, a couple hundred megabytes. Uh, sorry, a couple hundred uh, kilobytes, sorry. Um, so yeah, that, that's really exciting. And this is some of the potential we see in the computer vision space to take advantage of. And yeah, so that kind of does it from part two. Charles, I'm going to hand off to you now to go to the software side for part three. Yeah, and I think whilst we transition, a couple of key things that come to mind, especially I think with what we, we get asked a lot is uh, focusing in on the, the results that, that we've seen here is sort of, you know, how, how long does it take to produce the, these results? So. I think that, yeah. that, that would be a good good thing to delve into as well. Yeah, no, great, great question. And it's good, to, it's good to highlight that. So 
you can imagine, of course, that the time it takes to optimize depends on a few things like the constraints, but especially the data set. So the data set complexity really adds to the duration of optimization. And to give you a simple heuristic, you know, scaling something from a CIFAR 100 level data set, which will take a couple hours on a GPU, really not that long, really not that intensive, up to a full image net where you're dealing with millions of images, thousands of classes, that really scales from a couple hours to a few days. And this is intuitive based on some of the training times you see. But I think to your point, Charles, making this process as scaled one fast as fast as possible will really lead to more breakthroughs. I think where we are now is healthy. We want to make the turnaround quickly, but we have a lot of room for improvement to keep making the cost of optimization less and less so that it's easier to, to do. And, and the other thing is the, the ease of, you know, handling kind of off the shelf models with kind of off the shelf data sets versus somebody that has, or a customer that has, you know, obviously a custom model with a custom data set, you know, is it a you know, sim similar process or there are complexities in involved in that? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think from a workflow principle, ideally you want to have the standard and the custom things be able to be handled by the same tool chains and have applicability to both. You don't want to limit people into, well, don't use these custom layers, even if they're good for you, or don't, don't just use off the shelf stuff. So as a principle, we enable optimization of heavily custom things, but also off the shelf models as well, with the caveat being of, in some cases with great custom layer types, custom loss functions, there's a little extra work to do, like, like integrating with an API. And so at least at DeepLate, we've made this process very transparent, very easy. And we've baked in for custom models, for example, some simple APIs you can use to pass that to an optimization engine. But we really want to standardize this for what we're doing now and also going forward, where I think we can expect more layer types, more and more types of operations, more custom loss functions. So although we want optimization to be hands off, plug and play, we need a kind of white box scenario where we can account for these new layer types, new operation types as, as they will doubtlessly come into play. Cool. That's All right. So I will take over from here, hopefully. So uh, yeah, thanks everyone for, for uh, you know, walking through the, the part one and two with, with Davis there. So part three is, is really all about the, the, the software stack for Edge AI. And obviously that's from a, a bias perspective, that's where Deep Light focuses and that's what we're, we're bringing to the market. But it's, um, it's interesting, you know, whilst we look at, you know, everything that's been going on with, with COVID and prior to COVID as well, you know, there's been a big, big drive in the market for obviously IoT and what comes with that, which is digital transformation and automation of processes and, and equipment. And, you know, with COVID, that's almost accelerated to a certain, uh, to a certain extent. But within that, is a sort of a, a multi-stakeholder sort of ecosystem. So the equipment manufacturer, uh, you know, the MCU or chip provider, the, the use case itself that you're trying to roll out. But the, 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 the heart of all of that is obviously the AI model itself. And when we're homing in on deep learning and, you know, an area that Deep Light is particularly uh, focused on, which is, you know, convolutional neural nets. So computer vision perception type models, you know, they are big uh, and typically large, you know, with large associated data sets and they're complex as well. So, you know, in order for that automation to be a reality, there needs to be automation to support that automation. So, uh, you know, that's where the kind of the union of and the combination of equipment uh, providers or hardware manufacturers, particularly the, the chip manufacturers and the software providers, you know, is going to become even, even more important. But if we home in on the, the models themselves, as I said, you know, they're, they're complex, you know, there's obviously lots of layers. And, you know, it's, it's not easy just to, you know, roll these models out in, into production in a, in a quick way. And, you know, if we home in on this, this last comment here in particular, where, you know, it's just not literally about getting those models to run on the end devices and to get them in the hands of the end users, but, you know, it's, it's what happens after that as well. So there's, you know, there's a continuous sort of learning as well as more data comes in. So, 
you know, the, the whole process of getting to automation, digitalized, digital transformation is not, you know, once the model is out there in the market, there's, there's continuous learning after that as well. So it's super important that as we move forwards in this market, that that union again between, you know, the, the software providers and of course the chip manufacturers becomes a, a tighter, tighter unit. Mm -hmm. And actually Charles, to that point, we just had a question. Um, I think it's really relevant to your last comment there. It's does the customer provide the hardware specs for the target device that the model will run on? And, and do you take this into consideration while optimizing the model? Yeah, so basically for, well, we're gonna dive into deep like what we're focused on from a model architecture sort of optimization perspective. So yes, we need to obviously understand what is the, for example, the memory that's available on that, that chipset. Mm -hmm. um, but as we go further down the stack as well in terms of you know, quantization techniques and inference as well, then yes, we need, there needs to be that tight understanding or knowledge between obviously what what the uh, what the constraints are of the hardware for uh, for example but i don't know davis if you want to add anything to that as well well no i think you i think you said it exactly right and from an optimization perspective it's really getting signals so the more signals you have about how good something is on the hardware the better you can optimize for it but in some cases these signals aren't necessary we can optimize kind of independent hardware agnostic reduce the number of parameters, reduce the number of operations, which will have benefit independent. But the more, and this is really to, to Charles' last point, the more we can couple what we're doing in the optimization level with what the hardware offers you, like cache sizes or bit, supported bit precisions, then you can really get cooking and, and really start to make something highly efficient. And I think we'll talk about that in, in just a second. It's a really, uh, really relevant question. Hmm. Yeah, so delving into the software stack side, side of things and, you know, obviously homing in on, on <clears throat> our specialty and what deep light is focused on. So obviously there's a lot, a lot of effort and work that goes on with different um, AI frameworks and techniques that are out there for designing and, and training models. But ultimately, you know, to, to get these models to run on, you know, these low, low power sort of, you know, low compute M MCUs is a, is a whole different ball game. You know, you've got the the luxury of the the cloud infrastructure and heavy compute to sort of design and train these models. That is costly in itself. But you know, once you want to get them to run on the edge device, as I mentioned, it's it's a whole new ball game. So, what what DeepLight is is focused on um, with a layer we call our content aware optimization is doing exactly that. So we're looking at the model architecture itself, and with our uh, design space uh, exploration and unique sort of technique that techniques that we've developed from a software engine perspective, we're able to, you know, reduce that, that model size. So to compress it to a size to fit on, you know, the memory constraints, for example, of the, uh, of the MCU. And obviously look at techniques in how we can, you know, accelerate those, uh, the, those models as well. So that's fundamentally the, the, the layer that we're focused on is really homing in on, on that model architecture of the, uh, of the specific AI model. And then looking at taking that a step further. So where we can complement that model architecture optimization with other techniques such as uh, quantization, for example. So we, we call that platform aware optimization. And to the question that we just answered, you know, that's where, we're looking even further into, you know, the, the hardware and the constraints and the signals and everything. So we can apply the relevant uh, quantization and compression to get the model to run as fast as possible, as energy and efficient as possible on the edge device. So um, we're, we're going down that path uh, from a, a CPU perspective, because we, we really feel that you know, in order for these deep learning models to really get out there on these billions of, um, of, of chips and devices over the coming years, you know, that there, there really needs to be this uh, aggressive, you know, compression of the models to get them to, to roll out on mass, mass market. Mm -hmm. Another question that, that just uh, came in, Charles, um, slightly, slightly uh, technical nature, but the question is, does approximate computing have any role in TinyML? 
So maybe I can. So, so I think you better take that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to leave, leave you hanging there. No, it's, it's a really, so the simple answer is yes, absolutely. I think a lot of optimization, a lot of what we're doing here is in some sense approximate computing. I think I want to bifurcate like compression for the sake of compression versus op, like optimizing. The reason being is that to the question of approximate computing, it's really about what's relevant in your given scenario. What's relevant from a data perspective? What's relevant in, in terms of if you're using a neural network? What's relevant in a neural network? So absolutely, approximate computing is super, super important in general. And I think that the tricky part for practitioners is, okay, well, what's the balance between performance and then, and then efficiency? And so I think there's a big bag of tricks people can use to achieve that. And uh, the hard part as a practitioner is, okay, well, how do we implement them together? And even as this, this chart kind of alludes to, there's a huge amount of complementary techniques you can do. Like an obvious one would be, you can prune a net, then you can do some uh, like Huffman encoding or compression, and then you can quantize the weight. So all of those are different types of quantizations or, or optimizations, but they all work together really well actually to get the best result. So I think what I would encourage practitioners to do is like, just take everything you have that, that, that's available to you to get the most out of your, your stack. Well, I can't believe it. I was going to say exactly the same thing. So that is <laughs> I incredible. stole the words from your mouth, man. I know, yeah. I know, I know. <laughs> Great. So um, just to sort of wrap things up in terms of, uh, you know, what Deep Light is offering from a, a content aware optimization perspective. So like I said, really homing in on that, that model architecture. And this might be a bit of a, an eye test. So um, hopefully you can see it, but if not, uh, we, you know, we're certainly open to providing sort of uh, demos and trials of our, our software. But, you know, we at DeepLight, we, in this coupling of, you know, the chip manufacturers and, and the software itself, we, we're trying to make this as automated and as easy to, to do as possible. So with a, our software engine that we have available in the market today, we have an automated process. So what you're seeing here is your original trained model on the left and you know, the optimized, compressed, more efficient model on, on the right. So in order to get to that endpoint, it, it's an automated process through, through our software. So what you're seeing in the demo here is basically just literally one line of code. So we've try to simplify this as much as possible, where you are inputting your model, the associated uh, you know, data set and the desired compression level, you know, how aggressive you want to be. But the, one of the key KPIs in all of this is it's all well and good producing that optimized model, but what does that do to the accuracy of the model? So within our software, you can also specify that acceptable accuracy level. So that is a KPI that you can manage and determine. And that again is, 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 is an automated process. So once you've inputted this single line of code, it's literally as simple as letting deep light software get to work and you press run and then we'll, you know, we'll, we'll find that optimized model. And it will also specify the estimated time it will take to produce that optimized model. But uh, you know, typically it's a very short period of time. Depending on the the model size, the associated data set, it could you know it could be a matter of hours. Um, if it's a you know full image net, for example, you know a very large size model, huge data set, you know it could could take twenty four hours, you know a, a few days. But it compared to doing this from a manual perspective, it's super super fast, and you get a a, a great result at the end whilst maintaining your your accuracy level. Yeah, Charles. One one thing um, I'm I'm just maybe want to, curious what, what you want to add to is you know of course we're focused in the computer vision perception space at DeepLight. That's where we, we optimize quite extensively within that application domain. Have you seen certain sectors or verticals or, or certain areas that are really hot spots for activity with optimization? Or because you mentioned the accuracy trade offs and controls, so you can imagine in of course automotive in some spaces accuracy is super crucial. I'm just curious within that uh, computer vision perception, what kind of sectors do you, do you keep your eyes on? Yeah, well, certainly, you know, the autonomous vehicles is is a big one, and and trying to you know optimize, you know, as, and get to run as many models on the different compute power, you know, that's available as much as possible. But 
It's interesting. I mean, it, it's kind of across the board, but there's a there's a there's a huge demand in smart manufacturing right now. So being able to um, do AOI, so automated optical in inspection, you know, at the edge, that's becoming critical as we accelerate this whole automated digital transformation process as well. Um, there's, you know, umpteen security surveillance cameras now that are being rolled out mass scale. And again, mm -hmm. to be able to, you know, identify people um, uh, and, uh, you know, customer attraction in retail stores, for example, as well, being able to do that all at the edge. So that that surge in terms of, you know, cameras being rolled out is is seeing, a, you know, a mass adoption of more intelligence at the edge. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's quite, quite widespread, but I think smart manufacturing is a, is a hot spot right now, security and surveillance. Um, and even uh, from, you know, IOT, an IOT perspective, you know, ag tech has, has uh, adopted that fairly aggressively. And I think the, with the, the use of drones and, and other cameras, you know, that's, that's gonna be used on mass scale as well. So that, that, that's some of my, mm -hmm what I've seen anyway. Yeah, cool, cool. And and just one to the demo here you were showing, one quick question I, I think is uh, is relevant is the output file to save the optimized models. So in this example, you see Onyx, uh, that's, that is actually meant to be open neural network exchange to port between different inference engines like uh, TensorRT or other ones as well. At DeepLight, we also output a PyTorch, a PyTorch so a PFTTH file. And currently we have a KRAT TFKRS version in beta. So the idea is that really to be as interoperable as possible. We want you to take this optimized model and be able, I think to, to Jason's question, uh, run it on different various software stacks. Great, so on that note, um, you know, for anybody that's uh, attending today, um, you know, we would be very happy to, to do a more in-depth demo of, of our software and walk you through that in more detail. And, and of course, uh, for anybody that's interested in, in trialing the software as well, you know, we'd love to, we'd love to have a discussion, uh, you know, around that. So uh, you can go to our, our URL there, deeplight.ai slash demo. Um, but yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's really what we wanted to, to cover today. And I think now we will wrap up and then we'll be open for, for questions. So Davis, if you wanna take it from here. Awesome. Yeah. No. Th thanks, Charles, and, and thanks everyone for for hanging with us to the presentation here. So, as a quick summary, uh, you know, there there really is a new caliber of, of models and techniques emerging for for the edge, for the very edge, in tiny ML. I think being conscious of that and standardizing that will have a big big benefits. The new chips are everywhere uh, for inferencing, especially, and a lot of them require optimization, require some kind of of intelligent uh, design to make the most of this 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 uh, new class of processors. And then last but not least, to really what Charles was talking about in terms of the models being the centerpiece of a lot of new products, um, we need more from the AI software ecosystem. We, we need to do more to make that as easy to do as possible, to make it as seamless as possible, and ultimately have the same kind of DevOps and MLOps infrastructure or some kind of equivalent for doing edge AI going forward as these best practices keep changing. So with that, um, you know, thank you everyone for, for listening to the slides here. I'm more than happy to reach out to, to Charles, myself, or, or Deep Light. Happy to follow up the conversation there. And let's transition into, into some Q&A. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, guys. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, I have to say, at the beginning, when you did your tiny ML slide and you were talking about the... Uh, the trigger words and happening around the house. I was glad I had headphones and you didn't say any of the Siri or uh, <laughs> Alexa trigger words because um, I, I know what happens when you say one of those and my entire house lights up with every device searching and listening to me. So yeah, I mean, it was yeah really, really interesting talk and, and I agree, you know, the, the proliferation, these small low power devices going forward and tiny ML really is really incredible. And the work you guys are doing is just awesome. I mean, that demo you guys showed, uh, and I hope you uh, attendees also managed to see that as well, how simple it is, how in incredibly simple it is, and yet the powerful optimizations across model architecture and, and platform as well were just awesome. Uh, so really, really good stuff. Um, so yeah, we've got a chance now for, I've got a couple of questions uh, that came to mind when uh, we were running through, but if anyone's got any other questions, do whack them in the chat or in the Q&A. 
Uh, but also feel free to uh, raise your hand if you know how to do that in the Zoom uh, function or just say that you want to ask a question in the open mics and we can unmute you. Um, so I just wanted to get your thoughts uh, and, and perspective on things like, uh, you know, auto ML, neural architecture search as, as optimizations and, and other things uh, such as that. What are your guys' thoughts on, on those things, auto ML and neural architecture mm. search? Well, yeah, uh, thanks, Tobias. I, I can start and Charles, please, please feel free to, to, to add on to it. But in general, the terms are really broad. So AutoML is like this very, very catch-all term for anything that seems to be automated with machine learning. And it's a really cool trend and it'll be really powerful because one of the most scarce things nowadays is, is the talent to, to do this kind of deep learning, to do this kind of machine learning. So AutoML and architecture search have really important roles to play, uh, I think, from that perspective. But it's very early days still. And a really good example of this is if you throw your data at like your cloud auto ML and ask it to make a neural network for you, often what comes out is not human friendly. It's this kind of garble of, of stuff connected in a way that's unintuitive. And that's a big barrier when we want to introspect or actually use something generated by auto ML. Um, as a couple of their comments, you know, it can be costly, it can be slow. Again, that's mostly due to the early days and the compute requirements, which is kind of the I think the dirty secret of a lot of deep learning is just how much compute you need to, to train and do stuff uh, at scale. So from that perspective, it is useful. I think I have a big role to play. In some way, we're also involved in this AutoML uh, ecosystem. We use lots of automation and, and machine learning to automate a lot of our own processes at DeepLight. So super useful from that perspective, but, but early days, I think, is, is our uh, sense so far. Cool. Yeah, no, really, really interesting. And in terms of the optimization techniques you mentioned then, uh, are you able to use multiple methods on a single model with, with what you're talking about there or are we in, 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 uh, in, in your deep, in, in deep light side of things? Yeah, yeah. short answer is absolutely. Yeah, we can. I mean, we, we mentioned about sort of design space exploration. I mean, we, we mm. basically have come up with our unique approach to this sort of combining sort of some, you know, well-known te techniques out there, but also, you know, combining it with our own IP as well. So, um, you know, there's, there's lots of sort of buzzwords out there, like, you know, pruning, for example, but, you know, from our perspective, that, that forgive the, the pun, but that doesn't cut it. So <laughs> <laughs> <You're> forgiven. <laughs> So, um, yeah, basically, you know, it, uh, you know, I think one of the key things is, is, uh, you know, Dave, I'll let Davis maybe explain a bit more about maybe some of the uniques we're focused on, but, you know, the, the approach we took was really, you know, is, is really tightly coupled with that accuracy of the model and maintaining that. So, you know, some techniques that are out there as well you know open source as well you know they they have a really big impact on the accuracy of the model and it drops significantly and you're never going to get that out into the market on the edge device if it's not good enough so that is absolutely fundamental so the approach we've taken to the development of our software has that sort of you know top of mind as well as the ease of use of our software and obviously getting the best result you you can to fit you know, the, on the, the memory or, or the availability of the, the MCU, for example, mm -hmm. it's, you know, that making sure that, you know, you have that acceptable accuracy is, is top of mind for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 uh, it's probably an underrated point because it's, it's just, there's a lot of, like Charles mentioned, pruning, for example. But I think one of the really cool things, especially how we try to come at it is, is keeping this openness for, for, for further optimizations. And an interesting story that's happening right now um, to give an example is we compress like a Resin 50 workload pretty heavily using our approach. And then after deep lights optimization, the partner applied some sparsity methods like, like weight pruning essentially, unstructured pruning to make it even further optimized, pushing things into like the single megabytes even for, for a Resin 50 workload. So, so that really kind of thing kind of shows the whole story here of that as much as there'd be a great kind of golden golden button to push and make it perfect, in reality, what's happening behind the scenes is a huge bag of complementary techniques applied together to achieve the best result. And as Charles was alluding to, this mixed bag of tricks is really a must in a lot of cases to get you to where you need to be for, for inference. Awesome. Yeah, really, really interesting. And actually, we just had a question come in, uh, and forgive my mispronunciation if I have, from class uh, to you guys, that one of the first slides discussed uh, infinite inference at the edge and wondering whether online learning and training or continuous training 
uh, is also possible using your optimization techniques. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, that's a really that's a really cool topic. So in a nutshell, there's two parts to, to the continuous uh, improvement of training. There's updating your weights based on new inputs and new data, and then updating your architecture. So at DeepLight, we update the architecture to be as efficient as possible, which leaves a lot of room for complement techniques like federated learning or, or, or continuous learning, as you refer to, to keep improving your model performance over time. And in places where you have data drift or concept drift, it's a must. You deploy your model initially, and it's only going to get worse over time uh, if you don't keep retraining. So our optimization, I think, is a precursor to get you there, to get you in a scenario where you can do this kind of continuous training. But there's a lot of other infrastructure at play and really cool things coming from some of the OEMs and some of the electronics makers in the field around continuous learning, federated learning, to take advantage of both. So improving your architecture to drive efficiency while improving your weights to get better accuracy. The two together with some kind of, even in some cases, minimal infrastructure to just keep getting new input distributions. Uh, if you can on the device, that's really cool. Worst case, send that data back to DevOps and do it there and then push the result back. So both are, are the paradigm you could use. I think it's early on from what we see, but to that question, I think it's really like, that's the future for a lot of these devices is having some ability to do that kind of retraining. Awesome. So if there's, we've got a final couple of minutes now for any final questions anyone's got, uh, do whack them in the chat or put them in the Q&A. I'm sure, I mean, Davis and Charles, you guys are awesome. So uh, feel free to uh, put any questions in. Uh, this is a golden opportunity to uh, ask these uh, them both about this. I mean, before, while we're waiting for that one more to come in uh, before we go, one final one from me is, um, and people may think this is obvious, but uh, if, you're, if you're well familiar with the framework side of things, but what optimization uh, do you get uh, or can you get from the existing frameworks like, like TensorFlow? Um, and, and, and expanding a bit on that, I guess, you know, what, are you, what optimizations have you seen from, from those sort of frameworks? Yeah, it's, so it does exist. And like AutoML, optimization is another one of those blanket terms. So it's hard to yeah. kind of draw the line from what is and isn't optimization. But two of the ones we see from frameworks are unstructured pruning. So it's weight pruning, essentially. Uh, so that is available in, in a few frameworks. And then intake quantization. I think those two are very standard and integrated. They have their limits in terms of benefits, but uh, you can expect to quantize your model. You can expect to do some kind of pruning from the frameworks. Uh, and that's become pretty commonplace. I think we'll see more stuff added over time. But um, at the end of the day, you know, frameworks get you, get you so far. They're really useful to make it easier to develop. But optimizations, it's different, uh, different set of tricks, really. Yeah, absolutely. And we've actually had a question just before we wrap up. And if there are any final questions, do at them because this is your final chance to ask how to reach out for you on further discussion on things like federated uh, learning and other bits and pieces. Uh, there's been a lot of people who've uh, who said this as well. They're really excited about the technology you guys are doing. And I couldn't agree more. So how would they, how could they reach out to you? Cool. Well, well, Charles's home number is five. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, only, yeah, well, I'm only joking. Yeah. So please, please, please feel free. Um, I, I, I don't think it, they're in these slides, but um, you can find us online at deepwhite.ai under under our, our info. I can also shoot in um, just a quick, uh, I'll type that in there. More than happy to keep the conversation going. You can drop, drop myself a line here. I'd say either through the site, through LinkedIn, um, I'm very responsive and uh, are, are, we'd be more than happy to, to keep, keep in touch. Awesome. Yeah, really do reach out to these guys. They are and they're fantastic. And yeah, you can learn a lot from them. I certainly have. Awesome. So unless anyone's got any final questions, I'll, um, I'll start wrapping up. So I guess all that remains to say is thank you both for uh, one of the most engaging talks, not just in our AI virtual tech talk series, but one of the most engaging I've ever had. Fantastic presentation. Really, really interesting. Uh, just to say before we go, uh, that as you finish off the talk today, there will be a survey to fill out. If you could please fill that, fill that out, that'd be great. Uh, and if you do, then you'll be entered into a chance of winning an Arduino Nano 33 development board. Uh, so do give that a go. We'll be entering into a random draw and drawing a few people for uh, the talks in a couple of weeks. Uh, and please don't forget to, to catch up with those. They'll be November 17th. Uh, from NXP, Clever Devices and Octurus, and December the 8th from Slamcore before we all break up for Christmas. Uh, and of course, you can follow us on, on Twitter and tweet us there, Arm Software Dev. Uh, and we will soon be uploading the recording of this uh, webinar to our Arm YouTube channel. 
and you can find a bunch of other content both on this and our software development YouTube channel uh, as well. The slides for this will be available soon afterwards and you'll be able to click on the links to find it, but a simple Google will also uh, enable you to do that. So as a, all that remains to say is to, again, thank you both uh, Davis and Charles for an awesome presentation. And uh, we look forward to catching the rest of you guys uh, at our next AI virtual tech talk. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Tobias. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you.